we're going to be talking about two types of solids, crystalline and amorphous. Crystalline solids have regular arrangement in their pieces, while amorphous solids lack internal structure. You can see in the picture below that silicon dioxide in its quartz form is a crystalline structure. It's very ordered, while silicon dioxide in its glass form is not ordered. Crystalline solids, you can see whenever they are cleaved or struck, they're going to have this regular repeating unit. This galena looks like it's in cubes. Pyrite is in cubes. The quartz is in this pointy shape. Some amor amorphous solids would be like obsidian, which is volcanic glass. Wax is an amorphous solid. Crystalline solids have a lattice and unit cells. A lattice is a 3D view of a crystal showing the positions of the atom molecular ions. While unit cells are the smallest repeating unit of the lattice. Here we can see our unit cell and those make up our lattice. There's three types of crystalline structures or solids, ionic, molecular, and atomic. We're going to be looking more at these on the following slides. Ionic solids have ions at the lattice points. Molecular solids have molecules at the lattice points. And atomic solids have atoms at the lattice points. So first, looking at these three pictures, figure out which one is an ionic, which one is atomic, and which one is a molecular solid. Restart when you have your answer. So this first one, diamond, has carbons at each lattice point. Carbon is an atom, so this would be an atomic solid. This middle one, sodium chloride, has sodium and chlorine ions at each lattice point, and that would be an ionic solid. And over here with ice, we have water molecules at each lattice point, and water is a molecular solid. So just as we saw a second ago, ionic solids have ions at their lattice points. They're held together by strong electrostatic forces between oppositely charged ions. Ionic solids have very high melting points and very high columbic attractions between the ions. Remember that high columbic attractions is when we have small ions and highly charged ions. So the smaller the ions and the higher the charge, the stronger the columbic attraction. These have very high melting points because we would have to break this ionic bond between the sodium, or in this case, lithium and chlorine, in order for it to undergo a phase change, such as vaporizing. So we have ionic bonds within and between the ions, which are very strong compared to our intermolecular forces that we were talking about last time, such as dipole-dipole or Lenin dispersion. So which would have a higher melting point, sodium chloride or magnesium chloride, and justify your answer? We're going to pause the video, restart when you have an answer written down. You should have said magnesium chloride because magnesium has a higher charge than sodium does, although they both have chlorine ions. When magnesium has a higher charge, it causes it to have a greater columbic attraction. So magnesium chloride, both magnesium chloride and sodium chloride both have chloride ion. But the cations are different charges. Magnesium plus two is going to have a greater columbic attraction for chlorine than sodium ion.
A molecular solid occurs when you have covalent bonding within a molecule and intermolecular forces between the molecules. These are going to have much lower melting points than ionic. Because again, I'm breaking intermolecular forces. I'm not breaking covalent bonds. And intermolecular forces are much weaker than an actual bond. Finally, an atomic solid, there's three different types that we'll be seeing. Group 8A, which is simply our noble gases. Our noble gases are going to be the weakest atomic solid because they only have attraction due to London dispersion forces. We have network solids and metallic solids. Network solids are formed by atomic solids that are a giant molecule. Network solids are usually brittle and do not conduct electricity or heat. Although they're brittle, they have extremely high melting and boiling points. Some examples of network solids are carbon, silicon, and silicon dioxide. In the network solid, we're going to have nonmetals with covalent bonds within and between atoms. So network solids are very difficult to undergo phase changes. Unlike a molecular solid, which would only need to break an intermolecular force to boil, network solids have to have a covalent bond broken in order for the substance to boil. If you look at diamond, we have carbon, carbon, and a covalent bond between and within the carbons. So we would be breaking these covalent bonds in order to get diamond to, bo to boil. And that's why you don't see liquid diamond or diamond gas. Graphite, although it's also just carbons, has much different properties than diamond. As you can see from the structure, it does have covalent bonds between the carbons, but it's in different layers. And these layers have weak intermolecular forces between them. Compare this to water. Water, we would be breaking these intermolecular forces, but we're keeping the water molecule together. We don't break the covalent bond when water boils. While when diamond would boil, we would break the covalent bond. So sulfur dioxide melts at 201 Kelvin, while silicon dioxide melts at 1,883 Kelvin. Account for the difference in melting point. Pause the video, restart when you have your answer. You should say which type of solid both of these are, and what type of forces must be broken in order for it to undergo uh, phase change, in this case melting. So sulfur dioxide is a molecular solid with dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. These have to be weakened in order to allow sulfur dioxide to melt. Silicon dioxide, however, is a network solid, which means it has covalent bonds within and between the silicon and oxygen atoms. Covalent bonds require a lot more energy to weaken and break than dipole-dipole forces, causing silicon dioxide to have a higher melting point. Semiconductors are another type of network solid because they occur in silicon, which is a network solid. Semiconductors are a substance conducting only a slight electric current at room temperature. However, as temperature increases, conductivity increases. This is unlike other metals whose conductivity usually decreases with a higher temperature. This is important for things like computers, where when they heat up, we wouldn't want them to shut down. There's two types of semiconductors which you need to be aware of. There's p-type and n-type. 
In a p-type semiconductor, the semiconductor is doped with atoms that contain less valence electrons than the main material, such as silicon has four valence electrons. So if we dope it with boron, aluminum, or gallium, then this would become a p-type semiconductor, p4 positive. You can also see that over here, boron has one less electron, and so it would be an electron acceptor. N-type is when the semiconductor is doped with atoms that contain more valence electrons than the main material. So if we're using silicon, if we doped it with nitrogen, phosphorus, or arsenic, those would be an N-type or negative type semiconductor because they're giving electrons to the semiconductor. So here we have phosphorus and it has an extra electron than the surrounding silicones. Metallic bonding occurs in metals, which is another type of atomic solid. In metallic bonding we have delocalized non-directional covalent bonding happening. In other words, our electrons aren't tied to one atom. They're going to be moving around in a sea of electrons between the metal ions. This allows them to conduct heat, electricity, they're malleable, ductile, and have high melting points. It's difficult to separate the atoms, but easy to move them around because they stay in contact with each other due to the mobile electrons found in the metals, that sea of electrons. We can see that in these pictures. So in A, we're seeing the mobile electrons moving around between the gold atoms. In B, we can see that electricity is able to be passed through the metal cations. C is showing the transfer of heat going between them. And D is showing how it's malleable and ductile. If we push where the red arrow is pushing, it's just sliding the atoms over. The layers of the atoms in a metal are hard to pull apart because the electrons holding them together. And that's why metals are tough. Individual atoms are not held together in any specific atoms. Hence why atoms slip past one another. And that's what causes metals to be ductile. An alloy is a substance that contains a mixture of elements and has metallic properties. There's two types of alloys, substitutional and interstitial. Alloys, again, are going to have metallic properties. So in substitutional alloys, some of the host metal atoms are replaced by other metal atoms of similar size. So that would be like brass, which is copper, and a few zinc atoms spread out. Sterling silver, which is mostly silver, but then we have a couple of other metals thrown in. Pewter, if you don't know what pewter is, that would be like little statues you may find inside gift stores. Interstitial alloys are formed when some of the holes in the closest packed metal structure are occupied by smaller atoms, such as steel. So in steel we have lots of iron atoms and then in the holes there, some of the holes are going to be filled with carbon. Explain why solid potassium conducts an electric current, whereas solid potassium nitrate does not. Restart when you have an answer. So you should have said that potassium has metallic bonding which is characterized by delocalized electrons. This allows the electric current to flow through the solid. 
Potassium nitrate is ionically bonded, which doesn't allow for electric current to flow while potassium nitrate is in the solid form. But it would conduct in its liquid or aqueous forms since the ions would be free to move and carry the charge. Go ahead and pause the video and restart when you figured out which type of solid each of the following form. Your choices are atomic, molecular, ionic, and network solids. You should have gotten that iron is an atomic solid with metallic properties. Ethane contains nonpolar molecules, so it's a molecular solid. Calcium chloride contains ions, so it's ionic. Graphite is made up of nonpolar carbon atoms, covalently bonded, so that's a network solid. And fluorine is nonpolar molecules, so it's a molecular solid.